Oh, can you see it? Can you see the screen? Y yes, Professor, we can see the screen. Okay. Uh, you, you, you don't have to broadcast it now, can you? You can just wait for the everything to start. You're going to be the MC today? Yes, participants. Or good morning, depending on your time zone, for joining us today for this special lecture. This lecture is a part of IDEA's Advanced Certificate Program on Research in Political Economy. And we are honored to welcome Professor Jomo to deliver today's lecture. Professor Jomo has already delivered a lecture for this program earlier this month, uh, which was on food systems worsening malnutrition crisis. And we are delighted to have, it, to have him again for delivering another lecture today. Professor Jomo is a prominent economist from Malaysia, and he has taught at various universities around the world, including University Malaya, Yale, Harvard, and many others. He has also worked for several international organizations, including the United Nations. He is currently an advisor at the Khazana Research Institute and a visiting fellow at the Initiative for Policy Dialogue, Columbia University. Professor Sundaram will speak today on the role of U.S. policies in driving the world towards war and depression. He will speak initially for about 70 to 80 minutes, after which we will engage in discussion and take questions from the audience. So with that, I will now hand over the floor to Professor Jomo. Welcome, Professor. You can take the floor. Thank you very much, Ankur. Thank you for the invitation. And let me uh, get straight to the point. I'm going to make a two-part argument. Uh, the first part will be basically looking at the issues, uh, the international issues, and why I, I would like, why I believe that uh, policies, particularly the US um, Federal Reserve policies, but also other policies are causing the world to uh, slow down very badly, but and may well re result in a depression. Okay, uh, so it's not just a recession I'm talking about. I'm talking about depression because of the combination uh, with the consequences of war. I'm, of course, referring not only to the consequences of the Ukraine war, but also, uh, very importantly, the emerging Cold War and the tactics which are being used, uh, particularly led by the US uh, in dealing with the new Cold War. Um, now, uh, I will also make some concluding remarks about how uh, India in particular um, uh, is affected by the, 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 the new Cold War. Now, I think it's very important for us, uh, you know, although many people still talk about globalization, I would argue that the high tide of globalization is over. Uh, basically, what I mean by that is that there has not been significant trade liberalization since 1995. The WTO is the single most important uh, uh, free trade agreement uh, which has ever, which has been made, involves, uh, of course, all the members of the WTO. But more importantly, um, the various, uh, uh, many of the various uh, plurilateral uh, trade agreements and bilateral trade agreements have had very, very limited impact. And I would argue also that many of the rich countries are no longer interested in, uh, in trade liberalization uh, as they lose the ability to compete with uh, products from the global south. Um, now, it is also important to recognize that the WTO uh, rules uh, are terribly biased against developing countries. Uh, whereas the previous agreement, something called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, uh, allowed some flexibilities uh, the WTO does not. Uh, more importantly, the US exercises an effective veto in the WTO. For instance, over the last decade, the, by, by holding up the dispute settlement process, the US has rendered the WTO uh, quite ineffective. Now, um, the, the GATT arrangements, although they were very in, they were problematic in many ways, they allowed a lot of flexibility, which was important for developing countries. Um, it's also important to recognize that even great advocates of uh, trade liberalization, such as uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, who was an advisor or maybe still is an advisor to the uh, government of India, 
uh, he has basically argued that all these uh, uh, plurilateral free trade agreements are basically uh, like termites. They actually undermine globalization. They do not help globalization. Now, I think it's important to, to analytically to distinguish between trade and financial liberalization. And while there has been very little trade liberalization for almost three decades now, there has been uh, continued to be some degree of financial liberalization, but even that seems to be coming to an end. And a very important si uh, sign of this was the sanctions, financial sanctions, which have been imposed uh, by the United States, not only against Cuba and, and Iran uh, and, and uh, North Korea, but also against, uh, for example, uh, uh, Venezuela, and uh, more recently, of course, uh, Russia and Belarus. So all this basically suggests that we are seeing the end of fi financial liberalization as well. Although it is quite possible that financial liberalization will continue to have life uh, in, 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 uh, for some time to come. And we should not, as we should not define uh, trade liberalization and financial liberalization as necessarily going hand in hand. Now, another very important thing to remember is that sanctions have now become very, very, very common, commonplace, particularly for Western countries. Uh, for example, yesterday, the G7 issued a statement basically saying that those who do not uh, uh, adhere, who, those who continue to help Russia, uh, and that they don't even explain what they mean by helping Russia, uh, will basically be subject to sanctions. In other words, they are imposing sanctions. They can't be bothered with going to the UN Security Council to get approved approval for sanctions. All these sanctions are basically illegal under the UN Charter. The sanctions which have been imposed by all these by all, the unilateral sanctions which have been imposed uh, on all these countries. But nonetheless, as we know, uh, the sanctions are very important. More recently, in recent years, um, we find that in Washington, for example. Sanctions are considered as with weapons or instruments of what is called economic statecraft. Another development which became significant uh, during the time of uh, President Trump uh, was the whole idea of reshoring. Tr President Trump uh, had a very uh, limited view of underst uh, and understanding of how, what it would make, make to take to make America great again. And he wanted to pull back investments from China to come back to the US. It soon became clear to him and his advisors that this simply was not going to work. And so they have gone to a so-called so second best option of what is called friend shoring. So if you go, instead of coming back to the US, go to some other friendly country, some fr country which is friendly to the US or friendly to the West and locate your investments there. And this of course offers some opportunities, but it also is, is quite problematic and something which we you, you might want to discuss later. I've already mentioned that the, the, the financial liberalization has been reversed. And um, as you all know, um, last year, uh, sanctions against Russia in, involved a uh, so-called uh, SWIFT financial pay payment system. Uh, SWIFT financial uh, payments notification system is very fundamental to transfer of funds across borders. By keeping Russia out, and by restricting other countries from using it, there is increasing interest in developing an alternative uh, to the US dominated SWIFT uh, financial payments notification system. So it is quite possible that some of these alternative uh, systems may become much more viable and much more competitive uh, with, the, with, the US, with the US. Let me move on very quickly to uh, outline, emphasizing that why I'm, I'm very uh, concerned about the likelihood of greater stagnation. As you all know, um, th there was a major global financial crisis building up from 2008, 2000, 2007 to, and uh, broke in, at the end of 2008. And, it, uh, and uh, that, that we often refer to as a global financial crisis. And it led to a short uh, recession. And part of the reason why it was a short recession was because uh, Western governments, especially, pumped in a lot of money in the form of fiscal policy, in the form of fiscal and fiscal effort, uh, in order to 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 keep the economies going. Uh, 
uh, some of many of them, in fact, all of them, or most of them, uh, resorted to um, uh, trade restrictions as well. Um, so that that also reversed uh, the, the trade liberalisation I was talking about, and we find that in the more recent period there has been much more uh, unconventional, um, uh, so-called unconventional monetary um, uh, policies have been adopted. The most famous of which is something called quantitative easing, which has been basically to pump more money into the system. That is why many uh, central banks nowadays don't pay so much attention to indicators such as Q3, uh, sorry, M3, M4, which, which seem to have some significance uh, uh, about two decades ago. Um, another uh, consequence of raising interest rates, um, the US Fed started raising interest rates and uh, basically forcing many other central banks all over the world with the notable exception of Japan uh, from raising interest, uh, to forcing them to, to raise interest rates as well. For many countries, if you do not raise interest rates together with the US, there is a real risk that the capital will flow out of your country um, to, to these countries. And although the IMF Articles of Association allow uh, member, sta member states of the IMF to impose capital controls. This is a right of all sovereign countries. Uh, most, con many, most countries have uh, begun since, especially since the 1990s, uh, to not to, to exercise that right, uh, but have re really opened up their capital account. There was a Malaysian economist uh, writing about uh, more, than, more than six decades ago, who said this is basically like opening up a birdcage and expecting more birds to fly into the birdcage than to fly out of the birdcage. So I, I think this is a very appropriate kind of, uh, of uh, metaphor for what is happening. Um, now, unlike, the, uh, unlike in 2009, when, when, the, when many governments in the West adopted a, a strong fiscal effort, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, government, sp government spending efforts have basically down go turned down. Um, in developing countries, uh, very often uh, governments are already so indebted that they cannot afford to, to borrow even more uh, to spend in this time, especially with higher interest rates. Um, so what we find is that developing countries are in a very, very difficult situation now. And all this is made worse by the fact that most developing countries are in the tropical and subtropical zone. In the tropical and subtropical zone, it are, are now feeling the worst effects of global warming. Just to give you one example from South Asia as well as Southeast Asia, uh, countries like Vietnam and Bangladesh are now experiencing seawater coming into the rice fields. So this is going to badly affect uh, the ability to grow food. Of course, uh, they, well, many people are trying to develop uh, 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 rice which will which will uh, which will grow in in brackish water, but so far uh, the, the that research is still limited. So we are going to see and um, we are going to see rice output, for example, especially in countries like that, uh, being very uh, adversely affected. And then, of course, you know that the extreme weather event events have gone on, uh, have become much much worse. Uh, as you know, uh, Pakistan recently experienced uh, the a, a second flood. This, the, when the first flood happened less than a decade ago, it was referred to as a once in a century or once in a lifetime uh, exp, uh, uh, event, but it has already happened twice within uh, a decade. So you can see how extreme weather events are becoming very, very serious. Elsewhere, you see the speed, the speed and the velocity of cyclones, of uh, typhoons, of hurricanes. These are different names for similar uh, uh, weather phenomena uh, are, are, are getting are going from bad to worse. All this is affecting uh, commodity production, it's com affecting commodity incomes, and also uh, affecting commodity prices, uh, of, largely to the detriment of, 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 uh, uh, of consumers. Okay, so food security is very much uh, uh, threatened in this situation. I've already mentioned uh, the problems uh, associated uh, with sanctions, and I won't uh, go into that again. And I've also mentioned that now some of the instruments of economic warfare 
uh, which is becoming increasingly widespread, are no longer uh, simply those of trade. Increasingly, investments, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, reshoring and friendshoring, uh, technology and finance are uh, becoming very, very important uh, instruments and part of this uh, uh, situation, part of the problem now. Uh, moving on very quickly, I think it's important to recognize that the sanctions, uh, which I referred to earlier, are undermining... Um, they are, firstly, it's important to recognize that they are illegal. Okay, All sanctions are illegal. Even if a big country imposes those sanctions, a rich country imposes the sanctions, that doesn't make it less illegal. Okay, And what we find is that... Uh, um, what sorry, uh, uh, what we find is that um, you know th this this the situation now is that sanctions are becoming part of the problem, and ironically, the very people the West which was advocating globalization are now advocating sanctions, and that's those sanctions are undermining the globalization they once advocated. Unfortunately for many developing countries, most developing countries which have participated in this globalization effort have opened up their economies and they cannot simply switch back uh, into uh, emphasizing food security uh, and so on and so forth. So this is the jeopardy which, uh, in which many developing countries find themselves in. Now, um, so... Sanctions, as I mentioned, are now very, very much part of this new uh, 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 so-called Second Cold War. And um, we find that, that uh, this uh, so-called Second Cold War, uh, geopolitical priorities are, are, have become very, very important. And um, especially with the Ukraine war, which is about a year old now. And uh, as a consequence, you can see that there is less and less and very little money for the uh, for sustainable development, very little money to, to, to deal with climate change, so much so that the Economist uh, uh, magazine has advocated giving up the 1.5 degree Celsius uh, uh, cells ceiling for, for, for temperature uh, increases. Um, and uh, the, UN, the UN Secretary General a, a, a couple, three days ago uh, basically appealed in Addis Ababa uh, for 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 more money for Africa, uh, for more money for sustainable development, but that's the wrong place to appeal for that. You should he has to go to um, to 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 places where he's invited to, like such as Davos, and and tell them, or to Washington D.C. and tell them what 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 the situation is. And so this this is part of the problem which we face right now. So war. Um, is also causing inflation, okay, because of the restrict of the impact on so-called supply chains, right? So you have a combination of three things which have been had a massive impact uh, on supply chains in the recent period. Uh, the climate, of course, has been has been uh, becoming worse and worse. Uh, COVID nineteen, of course, is since twenty twenty, and uh, more recently, uh, the increased uh, uh, warfare. Um, and what we also find is that there has been uh, some, some uh, evidence, I would say is not the main reason, but some evidence of increased commodity uh, speculation. Uh, many of the companies which encourage commodity price speculation uh, have particular systems which tend to be pro-cyclical. They tend to, to cause uh, prices to go up uh, or to go down uh, in uh, reflecting the, the situation rather than to play a counter-cyclical role. The reason I'm emphasizing this is because when commodity exchanges were first introduced um, uh, uh, almost a century ago, the whole rationale for introducing them in the United States was that the hedging on in these uh, commodity exchanges would basically play a counter-cyclical role. But today, with the use of index uh, commodity uh, index indices, uh, what you find is that many of these commodities are combined together, and the result is uh, um, pro-cyclical rather than counter-cyclical. So, in in a in a bad situation, the the, the what what this uh, this type of commodity speculation does is to make it worse. 
Uh, and in a good situation, a boom, a boom can become a, a, a bubble, uh, precisely because of this kind of uh, procyclicality of, 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 the, of commodity speculation uh, under the new circumstances. All this is fairly recent. It's only happened basically about a couple of dec uh, decades uh, ago, from about a couple of decades ago. And we saw the worst effects of it around 2007, 2008, when food prices uh, went up. So we find as a result of the war in Ukraine, fuel, food, and fertilizer supplies have been uh, adversely affected. All this, of course, results in higher prices. And higher prices basically means farmers, many of whom cannot afford the higher prices, uh, basically use for less fertilizer. So the impact is not just going to be short term. The impact is going to be medium term because the farmers are using less fertilizer and, and output uh, in years to come will be adversely affected. So we find inflation, which starts off with around energy and food, uh, has mu huge implications and has multiplier effects of different types. Yet another uh, concern uh, we have right now is that we have, um, uh, you know, uh, because of the growing debt and debt problems which developing countries face, and this debt problems I want to emphasize are more serious than four decades ago. And the, the problems in four decades ago led to the loss uh, decade in Latin America and the a loss a quarter of a century in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, at that time, uh, many, most Asian countries had not borrowed very heavily from Western banks. But today, the situation is very different. The levels of borrowing are much, much higher. And so the exposure to debt is very, very great. And more importantly, and very importantly, much of the debt is not from governments, uh, but it is much more commercial. Uh, so the result is that you have more debt and more of it is commercial and a lot of it is non-bank. In other words, uh, through the issue of bonds and so on and so forth. So the result is that even if you have a financial crisis, it will be much, much more difficult to resolve it. As you all know, when the when the when the when the debt crisis in Argentina happened, um, it was very difficult to resolve. And when the debt crisis uh, else, elsewhere, uh, other debt crises happened in the nineteen uh, early nineteen eighties, uh, uh, they were very difficult to resolve. But eventually, uh, some of it was partially resolved. This time, it's going to be almost impossible to resolve because of this kind of situation. And we find that basically. Uh, this is going to make the situation worse. So you have a situation where, you know, uh, resource conflicts and you have food insecurity, uh, uh, which has, which um, uh, getting, go, going from bad to worse. I want to emphasize that, you know, according to, if you all, if you follow World Bank uh, uh, poverty data, the World Bank gives you the impression that poverty has basically declined a lot. Uh, at least until the until the middle of the last uh, decade, uh, um, but if you look at food insecurity, you will find that if you follow the FAO numbers, food insecurity has not been declining as much as poverty. Now, uh, and uh, more importantly, it has not been declining in the in recent years. So the situation, as far as food insecurity is concerned, is worse than the question of poverty which then raises the question, what is poverty measuring and what is food insecurity measuring? And this is a very interesting question, because if you look at what constitutes the poverty line, about 60 plus percent of the poverty line income is for food. Yeah? Almost two thirds of the poverty line income is to cover your food costs. Okay? And yet, you seem to have an improve, a decline in poverty, but people are still food insecure. So why is there such a huge discrepancy between the, 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 those lines? And a lot of it is because you can, you can measure uh, poverty in terms of simple cash incomes, uh, and you miss a lot of things. Uh, I was speaking to, the, the, to Angkor earlier, at the, before we started, about um, the, 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 the kinds of crops which are growing where he's, where he's doing research. And what, what you find is that in some, in some countries, in some places, you have a much greater variety of food which is produced. And much of the food which is produced by farmers does not even go into the market because they consume it themselves. 
Now, right in, in a situation where everything has to be bought in the market, through the market, then you are likely to find that your cash requirements to cover your basic food insecurity is going to basically um, uh, increase. And this is not captured by the usual um, uh, World Bank uh, numbers, which estimate the poverty line and so on. So the result, another uh, cause for concern is that there is even a declining uh, humanitarian uh, aid. Uh, aid has declined uh, very much uh, in, in over, especially since the end of the Cold War, about more than three decades ago, uh, but it has continued to decline. So even the promise of 0.7%, uh, okay, uh, which was made in 1970, 1970 yeah, that, that, that promise has not been met. And the current levels are just above 0.3, not 0.7, but 0.3, not even half of what was promised. And if you look, for example, at the money which was promised to help developing countries cope with climate change, again, a failure to deliver on that. So I think what we have is a situation where uh, developing countries are far, far more vulnerable because of the, of the changes which have taken place in the last few decades. And we need to be very, very concerned about this. Now I'm going to run through this very, very quickly. Uh, Basically, I think it's important for you to recognize that you know a, a lot, when you when you read the 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 business uh, the financial press when you follow the financial media you get the impression that there are so many things which are basically you know due to due to the research establishing um, uh, you know what what should be of concern what shouldn't be of concern and so on. But let's look at what has happened, uh, you know, in, in recent times. As I mentioned earlier, after the 2008 global financial crisis, there was unconventional quantitative easing. And the money was used, especially in the US, for what are called share buyouts. So the people, the, the dominant buy, uh, own, uh, people in the firm were buying out the smaller shareholders, getting very, very cheap money at almost 0%. Uh, interest rate. So they were so that's why you have a great concentration of wealth, and that's why you had a huge increase in the number of billionaires in the world during the last decade or so, uh, including during the pandemic. The pand while the rest of the world was suffering during the pandemic, the number of billionaires actually increased, and the wealth of the billionaires increased very very significantly as well. So this is a situation which is which doesn't seem to be to, to make sense, but it's very important for us to realize the nature of the of the economy, the world economy in which we live and what has been happening. So let me move on uh, very quickly to to character to emphasize that as I've tried to show for a variety of reasons, what the problem we have right now, as far as inflation is concerned, is that it's mainly supply side infl inflation or what uh, economists sometimes call cost push inflation. Okay, it may be pushed, prices are going up for various reasons. Okay, now in what, what does it, what happens when, 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 you, when you raise uh, interest rates? When you raise interest rates, you basically reduce spending. You reduce spending by consumers, you reduce spending by investors as well. Okay, that's what you do. It does not address the supply side disruptions at all. Okay, so raising interest rates does not address the problem at all. The second issue, which is important for you to remember, is that inflation is not accelerating. Okay, there's no evidence that inflation is accelerating now. Undoubtedly, during the four months after the uh, invasion of Ukraine uh, in late February uh, last year, uh, that means in March, April, May, June, there was a big uh, increase in prices, and you can say that it was accelerating during that period. But after those four months, if you look at the U.S. data, for example, and 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 uh, the CEPR in Washington D.C., there are two CEPRs. The one in Washington D.C. has shown that in fact um, inflation is not been accelerating since the middle of 2022. Okay, so we we have now those of you who have studied uh, 
you know, the standard economics. Even the standard economics will tell you that there's no reason to be excited about inflation, about dealing with inflation, if it is not accelerating. But here you have a situation where inflation is not accelerating, but those very gurus of economics are telling us to get very excited and raise interest rates. There's no basis for this. But then there is so the, the idea of what is considered moderate inflation. In fact, this has changed very, very arbitrarily uh, during the recent period. It's very important for us to remember that uh, you know, this has been a very, very arbitrary and, uh, change. Um, uh, during the 19, 19, uh, uh, 90s uh, and 80s, uh, very famous economists, very respectable mainstream economists, people like Stanley Fisher, Michael Bruno, who was the chief economist of the World Bank, um, and uh, uh, Rudigal Don Bush at MIT, uh, who collaborated with Stanley Fisher. For them, low double-digit inflation was considered moderate. You can live with it. Okay. Today, because of something which happened about 33 years ago, suddenly the definition of what is considered acceptable moderate inflation has changed to 2%. You know, um, uh, the US Fed chairman, uh, Powell, uh, says, you know, we are going to meet the 2% target. Now, where does this 2% target come from? It comes from New Zealand. What happened in New Zealand in 1989? The finance minister thought he was quite ambitious. He told the central bank government, uh, well, they call it the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. He said, I want to have, I want to bring down uh, in, uh, inflation. That will make me very popular. And I, and I want a slogan, two by, nine, two by 92. Okay. Yeah, at that time, inflation in New Zealand was high single digit, yeah, about eight plus nine percent. We are, I want two by 92. Completely arbitrary. Okay, central. Uh, uh, it wasn't. It didn't come. From, it wasn't a recommendation of the Reserve Bank. It came from the finance minister, and that became policy. And after New Zealand actually did drastically bring down interest rates, and then the government fell because of what they did. What happened was that this two percent inflation target became universalized, promoted by all kinds of people, including the IMF. So if anybody doesn't accept the 2% target, you're considered not quite, you know, you're not quite acceptable. So this 2% target, I want to emphasize, you know, it's very completely arbitrary. When I brought this to the attention to, of, of uh, Joseph Stiglitz, for example, he didn't realize this. He was quite shocked when he checked. It turned out to, what I said was completely true. So I want to emphasize this. You know, that this is completely arbitrary. I also want to emphasize that these interest rate hikes are a very blunt tool. And as I suggested earlier, it is very inappropriate because you have inflation due to supply disruptions rather than demands, dem excessive demand. So what it will do, it, it will reduce demand. It will slow down economies all over the world. And this is why I'm very concerned about what the US Fed has been doing and what central banks have been doing elsewhere to, to try to emulate uh, what the US Fed has been doing. Now, all this is deliberate, okay? It is nothing to do with market forces or anything like that. It is deliberate contractionary. And even conservative uh, mon um, economists who, who deal with monetary matters, people like, uh, people like uh, 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 Milton Friedman, and people like Ben Bernanke, they are all both very, very conservative, but they have pointed out that in, in during the during the Great Depression, it was the US Fed who raised interest rates, uh, according to them, prematurely, which killed the recovery uh, during uh, 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 during the second second term of uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. Um, um, in around 1937, uh, uh, I think. Yeah. And Bernanke showed the same thing uh, when the oil prices went up uh, around 1972, 73, and so on. Okay, so, so the Fed, rather than solving the problem, actually caused the problem, according to the two of them. Okay, so this is not some wild eyed radical economist saying, these are very conservative economists who also recognize. What the what the what the effects of Fed policy is, so I want to emphasize that previously 
Some of you may have heard my lectures in the past. I was very concerned about the possibility of stagflation because there was evidence, as you know, in the, in the second quarter of last year that there was inflation. Okay, Inflation seemed to be picking up. But since then, there is no evidence that inflation is accelerating. So there's no evidence of a likely stagflation. There is, however, a, a lot of evidence of a likely uh, stagnation. Okay. But there is, but thanks to declining inflation, you're not going to have stagflation. Now, so basically, uh, there's combination of policies pursued by the by the by the US, especially Fed policy. Okay, is basically causing a lot of the problems. In addition, you have trade uh, trade uh, uh, restrictions on the trade front, restrictions on the investment front, restrictions on the technology side. You all know about trips and Huawei and C and 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 uh, what and the and the U.S. rejecting the waiver request led by India and South Africa uh, to waive the uh, intellectual property rights uh, on anything related to the to the COVID nineteen pandemic only during the duration of the pandemic. Even that was not allowed. Uh, despite and and uh, so we we find that there's very little happening and then. Uh, more recently, of course, uh, TSMC, that means uh, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, 1,000 engineers were moved from Taiwan to uh, New Mexico. You know, just the whole plant was moved out of Taiwan. Okay, so, you, you know, this is basically, you know, it's virtual kidnapping, okay? You take away, you know, this is the kind of, 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 of economic uh, relations and basically undermining any hope of economic cooperation. So Fed interest rate hikes are causing a lot of problems. Deficit financing is a, is a huge problem now. And of course, uh, we know the geopolitical situation and so on. And of course, developing countries have even less policy space and less fiscal space in order to cope with this situation. So. What we have is a very, very bad situation for the reasons which I've mentioned earlier. And I don't, uh, I, I, I think I'll go much faster than I originally planned to, and I'll skip over uh, much of what I, what I say here. But I just want to emphasize one last thing here, and that is the difference of the US position compared to everybody else. And the US position is what somebody once referred, the uh, former French finance minister referred to as exorbitant privilege. Because under the Bretton Woods arrangements, and ever since then, the U.S. can continue to issue debt. Okay, The U.S. Treasury can just continue to issue bonds at very, very low cost to the U.S. And this has been, this is something which only the U.S. can do. Nobody else can do that because of the U.S. position, if effective position, position as the reserve currency. Since 1971, the Bretton Woods arrangements from 1944 do not no longer exist, but by convention, by practice, they nonetheless do exist. Some people say it is partly due to US power. Some people say uh, military, et cetera, et cetera. I won't get into that discussion right now, but the point is that this is what, this is the reality of the situation we're in. So just to reiterate the point about the nature of the new debt crisis which developing countries face. Now, let me quickly move now to uh, another issue, and that is the choices developing country face, developing countries face. And I want to make the, I want to emphasize that uh, it is very important for us to think very seriously about uh, non-alignment. Non-alignment is uh, more relevant now, in my view, than ever. In the in the past. It was non-alignment was a response to something called to the so-called first Cold War, which started at the end of the 1940s and continued basically until 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 the end of the 80s. Okay, Gorbachev basically brought an end to the Cold War. Now, um, there are various many, many things were done by the U.S. at that time. It created NATO, CENTO. CETO, which is a Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, and so on and so forth, almost all of which have been irrelevant except for NATO. And NATO has grown, has increased in size. 
Developing countries responded initially through the Bandung Conference, Afro-Asian um, uh, Afro Solidarity Movement. And a very important turning point was what happened with the Suez Canal. And what another part of the reason is, you know, the Israel backed by the US, sorry, by the UK and France attacked and tried to take over the, the Suez Canal after Nasser uh, nationalized it. And very interestingly, the US at that time uh, did not support the, 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 those three. And ever since the, after that, there was a period of tension between the US and, and uh, the U, UK and, and, and France and Israel. But those were long, that was long ago. Now the relations seem to be very, very tight. And uh, in, in 1961, uh, a country, Yugoslavia, which used to be, which was previously co considered to be part of the Soviet bloc before, uh, basically the leader of Yugoslavia, uh, Josep Tito, uh, basically broke away and he started the non-aligned movement he was joined by people like Nasser, Kwame Nkrumah, um, and, and others. And so the non-aligned movement was born. Essentially, as Bandung plus Latin Americans, plus uh, the, the non, those who didn't want, to, I didn't want to go the Soviet way. In 1967, ASEAN, where I'm, I, I live, uh, basically declared a zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality, which still exists on paper. But what we have seen last week, for example, is that the new uh, Filipino president, who is the son of a former Filipino president, has just allowed the U.S. to create even more, set up more uh, military bases in the U.S., uh, sorry, in the Philippines. And all these bases are in the northern part of Luzon Island, basically facing Taiwan. So they are likely to cause a, to play a very provocative role as far as Taiwan and China is concerned. And basically, we are creating the conditions for war rather than peace. And this is where, unfortunately, ASEAN has not exercised any discipline in terms of making sure that the member states of ASEAN do not contribute to, the, the, to, to breaking uh, non-alignment and neutrality. I want to emphasize that even during this period of the first Cold War, when you know, there seemed to be very great tension between the US and the Soviet Union and their various allies, there was cooperation. In 1979, the uh, Soviet Union uh, challenged uh, President Jimmy Carter. He said, let's cooperate and wipe out smallpox and uh, within a decade. And believe it or not, smallpox was eradicated within a decade. It's not 100% eradicated because some uh, a couple of countries have not uh, uh, done the necessary uh, immunization and so on. But smallpox is now largely, as far as most of the world is concerned, history. Okay, uh, That's why I think it is important for us to think again about the relevance of non-aligned movement. But it's not the old non-aligned movement which you are talking about. It is a non-aligned movement suitable for our times. So with the end of the, with the dissolution of Soviet Union, with the end of the first Cold War, the, there were many people, most notably a man named Francis Fukuyama, who talked about the end of history, the end of the Hegelian dialectic of history, uh, where liberal capitalism would, was triumphant. But what we have seen is that although capitalism has been triumphant, we are, what we have seen is a variety of capitalism all over the world. Many people would argue the Soviet, the form, Russia is now clearly capitalist. They make no pretensions otherwise. But uh, uh, many people would consider China to be quite capitalist as well. Okay, it's certainly a very mixed economy. Okay, of, under the leadership of a communist party, but it doesn't mean that it is uh, it is not capitalist. This is very important for us to, re to remember when you're analyzing uh, things from an from a economic point of view, uh, because um, as far back as the 1940s, uh, uh, after World War II, the, the, in Italy, for example, um, there was an, the, the Communist Party of Italy was trying to build capitalism, a different type of capitalism. They didn't want to have the big uh, corporations like Fiat and so on. They wanted to have the smaller corporate, smaller, small and medium enterprises, mainly medium-sized enterprises, 
and they they control an area around um, around uh, Bologna, uh, Emilia Romagna, and there they developed this because they controlled this region for for decades. They were always re-elected and re-elected, and they basically so you have a communist party government, basically creating the conditions for capitalist development. So just because you have a communist party in ruling doesn't mean that it is undermining capitalism, you know, but it's a different kind of capitalism. It was a medium-sized uh, enterprises they were encouraging. And many of you know these enterprises, or at least my generation, we know it. Uh, things like uh, the so-called white goods, you know, uh, uh, washing machines, uh, uh, what do you call them? Um, uh, uh, table fans, uh, you know, electrical appl household appliances. All these were made mainly in Italy. Names like Zanussi and so on were, uh, came from Italy. And so, you know, I think it's very important to recognize that there can be different types of capitalism. And then around 1982, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, um, uh, who, who had joined the the Reagan administration and later continued to work from the senior George Bush, yeah, George uh, H.W. Bush, he uh, came up with the so-called Wolfowitz Doctrine. And the Wolfowitz Doctrine, I would argue, continues to remain relevant until today. The Wolfowitz Doctrine wants America to be number one and no challenges at all. And that has been the, the doctrine of the United States ever since then. Um, now, initially, to to, there, there was a lot of tension because many of the Europeans were not happy with the U.S. being so dominant uh, and so on. Uh, but by around a decade ago, a number of things happened, especially around the year 2014, where um, it became very clear that the NATO was going to continue to expand eastwards despite promises made to Gorbachev and uh, to Boris Yeltsin, the, the rulers of, of, of Russia, uh, in the late in the late 1980s and, and 1990s, and uh, those 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 promises were not honored, and the Russians, uh, sorry, the NATO continued to push and include more and more. So in 19, 2013, um, there was an election uh, in in U Ukraine, and then uh, uh, um, basically. Uh, then, then that government, which was elected, was deemed to, to be pro-Soviet, uh, pro, sorry, pro-Russian. It was overthrown and a new government was brought in, not through elections. Uh, and that government uh, basically, and that government, um, and then, and then uh, Putin uh, moved in and took over Crimea. Now, Crimea used to be part of Russia. It was given to Ukraine in the 1950s by, by, by Khrushchev who was the leader of the Soviet Union at that time. And Khrushchev was uh, uh, a Ukrainian, okay? And, uh, and the Soviet Union didn't distinguish between the nationalities in those days. In 2014 also, Obama uh, announced his so-called pivot to Asia to encircle China. And this basically has been the policy of the US since then, although some very important variations. So what should be the appropriate response? For us in developing countries, we, war does not help. Okay, many people say, oh, World War II was very, very important to get the US out of depression. That might have been true at that time. And, uh, but for us in the world today, every, most of the arms which developing countries have are imported, are bought, and so on and so forth. Pacifism means the even less fiscal resources for other purposes. I'm sorry, militarism means less fiscal resources for other purposes. So my, I basically want, want I'm advocating pacifism and non-alignment. And this, I think, is very necessary for our times. So non-alignment, however, is not simply going back to 1961 or going back to something from the past, but it has to be a suitable non-alignment for our times. And we have to recognize that multilateralism is very much at risk. The U.S. has been, uh, sorry, the U.N. Uh, has been very much under attack uh, and is not able to function. It is largely missing in action, as you all know. Uh, and this is a very major problem. Um, and, uh, you know, it's largely ignored, except when it is convenient to use the U.N. for, for certain purposes. 
So everybody talks about the vote in the General Assembly, which was overwhelmingly against the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but nobody talks about the fact that all the uh, the NATO measures do not have the support of, um, of of the of the of the UN. Um, now, what has happened uh, as a result of this is that um, you know peace has been abandoned. The role of the UN in promoting sustainability has been abandoned, and of course, in promoting development. Another issue, of course, is that we have now completely unelected people telling us what to do. How many times have you heard policies announced by governments which are basically cooked up in Davos at the World Economic Forum, which is basically a forum of the richest people in the world? You know, So Davos is now the problem. It is not the solution, and we should not be legitimizing Davos as a solution. Now, basically, we have a series of a number of forces aligned on both sides. We have a very weak G77, which is basically a caucus of developing countries in the, U in the UN uh, system. And we have the non-aligned movement. That has to be greatly strengthened and consolidated in order to be much, much more effective against the other bloc, which is very strong, much more consolidated, cooperative. And that is the G7, NATO, OECD, and so on. And this, I think, is the choice which we have. So we have a choice now. The world has a choice between cooperation or barbarism, you know, dog eat dog kind of situation. And this is the situation. Unfortunately, now we are being told that the choice for many of for many of us in developing countries is to that China is the problem. China is the number one problem. I do, I'm not saying that. There are no problems raised by China's presence and so on. But I think it's important for us to recognize that 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 the that all these um, recent initiatives are basically to to isolate and encircle China, and uh, this include the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. It was a proposal of the Japanese. It was taken over by the Americans. Even Quad Quad was originally a cooperation to deal with disaster. After the the earthquake, uh, the underwater earthquake under uh, of nineteen uh, sorry of two thousand four, okay uh, in Aceh, and that resulted in 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 uh, the the um, it led to the re, uh, creation of the Quad. Now the Quad is a is a military strategic alliance, the Trans Pacific Partnership I've already mentioned, and most recently AUKUS. Look who's involved, Australia. UK, US, okay? And this, all this is very, very deliberate. And, um, you know, the UK built two uh, 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 aircraft carriers, and one of them has been deployed to the South China Sea. Which country in, in, in Southeast Asia or in East Asia invited the UK to come here? Nobody, but they feel that it is their right they are still living in their imperial dreams as if they can do it. Now, I used to make a big distinction between the US and Europe, and it was, I think, quite relevant in many earlier situations. Unfortunately, the situation now is very, very bad. And we have a situation, it is the West versus the rest. And the number, the top uh, European Union official is the, what is called the high representative. He's a vice president of the, of the European Commission, and his name is Joseph Borrell. And he basically said that the rest of the world is like a jungle wanting to invade the garden of Europe. Okay, this is how they see us. Okay, I'm not, this is a recent quotation from Mr. Borrell. Okay, it's not something which, you know, I'm not, I'm not making up this quote. Okay, you can easily check it. I've given you the sources and so on. So this is the situation, unfortunately, which we face. And we have to deal with it. Now, this now more most recently we have this new idea which has been promoted over the recent years, which is called the Indo-Pacific, linking the two oceans, Ind Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And of course, Southeast Asia links these two oceans. And we are going to be at that junction where we are, we in Southeast Asia are very, very uh, 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 vulnerable. Now, this idea was originally pushed by a German geopolitician, Karl Haushofer, 
who basically used it as a way of trying to get Japan and, and India and others not to, not to oppose uh, not the Nazis and its allies, the Axis powers during, uh, during, during uh, the 30s and 1940s. Okay, so, you know, it's, and, and of course, if you want, you can go back, uh, for those of you who have seen the TV series, the Borgias, uh, the, the Pope, uh, you know, the very corrupt Pope who had many, who had several children, um, you know, uh, Alexander the VI, uh, basically was responsible for the Tordesillas uh, Treaty, which divided up the world between Portugal and Spain. So everything, uh, initially everything, uh, east of of the Atlantic Ocean was was Portuguese. Everything west of the Atlantic Ocean was for Spain. But of course, uh, this was two years after uh, uh, Columbus uh, uh, so-called discovered uh, the America uh, America, and uh, and uh, but the the Portuguese were very very pow much more powerful then, and the Portuguese uh, demanded more, and they managed to get Brazil. So at one point during the 19th century, the king of Portugal couldn't even survive in Portugal. He had to run to Brazil to live, survive in Brazil for about half a century. Okay, and and this was the how the world was divided up, um, you know, uh, more than five centuries ago. But we are living in a in a new world. Okay, and uh, what we have seen, for example, now is that to serve this U.S. strategy. Uh, the former, the late uh, president, uh, Prime Minister Abe of uh, Japan basically has supported uh, Indian Prime Minister Modi's so-called Eastward uh, Initiative. And they basically want to try to get Japan and, uh, well, Japan is already firmly in the US camp, but they want to get India uh, very much into that camp as well. Now, this is wh why, wh this is why all these strategies are, are, are coming up. And uh, the, even the official you, uh, responsible for it is uh, the same official as before, um, Mr. Kurt Campbell, who was uh, Obama's, uh, who was the one who came up with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was subsequent, which subsequently Trump uh, dumped, and uh, which, which now exists in some kind of uh, uh, Frankensteinian mode uh, in the form of something called the CPTPP. So um, basically, um, what sorry, um, what we have now is a situation where, where, um, where the, um, to 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 dress it up a little bit, uh, they, the 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 Americans have offered uh, last year. Uh, President Biden uh, invited all the ASEAN heads of governments all. Almost all of them went and invited Fiji and a number of other countries, and they all went, and they all found themselves um, founding members of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. But what does this economic framework offer? Very little. He talks, Biden talks about writing the new rules for the 21st century economy. This was exactly the rhetoric Mr. Mr. Uh, President Obama used. Okay. It's all rhetoric, and it's almost it's almost unimaginative rhetoric because they are recycling the old rhetoric. Okay, and so they have basically identified four areas. India has said that they are not interested in the trade uh, uh, theme, um, but they are, they are they are, they are there's now discussion going on on the three themes. So earlier this month in Brisbane in Australia, the negotiations began, uh, but even the, the the present government of Japan is not so uh, gung-ho about all this compared to Abe's government and even uh, Suga's government after Abe. And the current government, Labour Party government in uh, Canberra is also less gung-ho than the former uh, uh, New Zealand government. So we have a situation where, where uh, the political situation is changing and I'm not even sure how long this Indo-Pacific uh, initiative is going to last. But I think it's important to realize that even market access is not being offered. Okay, uh, part of the reason for the interest in the TPP before was that at least there was access offered to the U.S. market, limited but still some access was offered. Vietnam, which had all kinds of historical problems, 
since the end of the uh, end of the Vietnam War was especially interested. But now, nothing. Now there's no market access is on offer. So you can see that forget about trade liberalization or anything like that. Uh, you 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 basically find that uh, you do not have, unlike for the success of the so-called Marshall Plan at the end of the 1940s, during the Cold War one, Cold War first Cold War, uh, unsup a very unsupportive economic context, unsupportive economic policies, and uh, so it's very unlikely that the IPF is going to work, except if it is driven by political leaders who choose to align themselves with the US. And that's why it's all the more important that developing countries uh, think twice about the options they have available. They think much, much more in terms of economic cooperation um, with everybody. I'm, I'm not saying that you only cooperate among ourselves. We cooperate with everybody, uh, but, but refuse to take sides in this uh, new Cold War. So let me stop here, and I hope we can have a debate and discussion on these issues. Thank you very much for your attention. Ankur? Yes. Thank you, Professor. We can take comments and questions now. Please raise your hand if you would like to ask question, and we will allow you to unmute one by one and ask your question. Yeah, sir, can I ask a question? Yes, Abhravesh, please go ahead. Yeah, so I, I would just, as an initial question, I'd just like to know uh, what is the, uh, how do we imagine uh, the relationship between fiscal and monetary policies given the stagnationary phase that we're in? Because of the fact that there is dominance of monetary policy across the world on, on a general level, um, which cannot control inflation, can we imagine a coordinative stance between fiscal and monetary policies which can actually bring down inflation and also sort of have, sort of bring about output stability? Thank you very much. I, that's a very important question. Unfortunately, as I was suggesting earlier, we do not have the exorbitant privilege which the US enjoys. So we are very, very much constrained. And a lot of the problem, the problem has been aggravated by the fact that most developing countries uh, have been borrowing very heavily. And usually the smaller countries as, and the more open economies have been borrowing from abroad, very often unnecessarily borrowing from abroad. But this has been enabled by the opening of the capital account, which I referred to earlier. So they are far more vulnerable. They have even less choice. And monetary policy is now subject to so many international in influences that there is very little scope for monetary policy. Some of us have been advocating what we call monetary, uh, monetary financing. In other words, using the central banks to, uh, to, to do uh, more. And I, um, I think many people didn't notice this, but even relatively conservative governments such as the Indonesian government and the Filipino government um, actually undertook some degree of monetary uh, financing. What they did, uh, in one case, they changed the law. In another case, they suspended the law. And they basically issued uh, uh, loans. The, the central bank directly issued loans to the, uh, to the fiscal, uh, to, 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 the gov to the treasury. So the government started spending by borrowing from, directly from the central bank. In other words, the debt does not go in the form of bonds which are traded in the market. There's no secondary market for those bonds. So this is a new form of trading, which turned out to work quite well. But of course, as we know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the space for this uh, is not something which is, you know, it, it depends on which, which countries are doing it, how much fiscal space they have, how much monetary space they have, how much they can do this, and so on and so forth. I think it's, we have to be very careful uh, about, uh, we have to be very careful about uh, uh, exaggerating uh, the, the, the options available. Uh, 
some of my friends who uh, believe who believe in MMT, so-called modern monetary theory, uh, they think you can just go around issuing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, debt. It, it's not not that simple, okay? Because um, you 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 just can't. You, you know, there are, you know, who's going when you, when you deal internationally, and all our economies are now very quite open to, to varying degrees, and especially for small economies, you have to have international eco economic relations. When you deal internationally, you have to still deal with an acceptable currency, okay? And you can so you don't have that degree of monetary free. Uh, policy freedom to be able to undertake to do to, for for that fiscal policy freedom which your question implied. So it's a very problematic situation. At the same time, I want to emphasize that you know some of the bigger uh, 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 middle income countries have done it just recently in response to. I, I only mentioned the two Southeast Asian countries because I, I was very interested when they did it. Uh, and of course, Japan has been doing it all this time. But of course, Japan is in a very different situation. Their debt now is more than 250% annual GDP, you know, but they are not bothered about it, you know, because most of their debt is issued to, 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 to Japanese. They are not traded internationally very much. So they are not vulnerable in the sense, in the way that other countries are vulnerable. This is the major constraint which we have and why some of us have been advocating for, for decades, you know, from even before the Asian financial crisis of, of 97, 98, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, not to open up the capital account. You know, uh, Thailand was very vulnerable precisely because it opened up the capital account and it allowed people to borrow uh, from foreign banks and to arbitrage on the in the domestic financial situation. Um, in the case of Indonesia, Indonesia was very vulnerable in those days because uh, the financial center of Indonesia is not even in Indonesia. It is in Singapore. You know, Malaysia was vulnerable for a completely different reason. Malaysia, although uh, after a, a bad experience in the 1980s, uh, Malaysia introduced something called a BAFIA, Banking, Bank and, Banking and Financial Institutions Act. And that prevented the kind of practices which the Thais undertook. Took. But in the case of Malaysia, the government at that time was very, so happy about the, the, uh, the buoyancy of the economy because of industrialization and so on. And they, uh, they opened up the, the, the capital market. They, they opened up uh, uh, you know, uh, stock markets and so on. In fact, they even the authorities went around the world encouraging people to buy uh, buy Malaysian stocks and shares, which is fine during the bubble. Everybody wants to buy your stocks and shares. Once the bubble bursts, or people in anticipation of the bubble bursting, they move their money out, and that was the end of the situation. So Malaysia was vulnerable, but not for the same reason Thailand was vulnerable, or not for the same reason Indonesia is vulnerable. There's a tendency to see all these situations as identical, which is wrong. And in fact, the other country which was badly hit was, of course, um, Korea. And again, in the Co Korean situation was also quite, quite different. So I think it's very important for us to analyze and learn from mistakes, learn from, from mistakes. And we don't do enough of that. We like to look at so-called best practices and seeming success stories, and we don't pay enough attention to uh, problems and how how we learn from those problems. And this, unfortunately, has been has been a major uh, problem for for in um, for many developing countries. So, what Indonesia can do, and what uh, uh, Indonesia in, could do in 2022. Uh, was is very different from what Indonesia could have done in say 19 uh, uh, in, in 1997 uh, 97 uh, 98 you know that brought down the president of Indonesia as you as some of you will know um, but uh, you know this this um, the situation is very different and we cannot uh, equate that so what is possible for India uh, of course will be very different from what is possible for a relatively small economy, uh, you know, uh, for, for, for Laos uh, or, or, you know, 
uh, for East Timor and, and, and so on and so forth. So we have to be very context specific. We need to know the situation in which we are dealing. We need to know um, we need to know how 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 to do things. And uh, there's nothing to be gained by uh, you know big talk. You know, oh, we we are going to get away from the from uh, we are going to uh, you know de delink from the world economy and so on. Well, delink if you want to, but you have to do it very quiet. quiet you do it quietly rather than co cause a problem so in the process of delinking, causing unnecessary problems. So this is a very very difficult uh, problem of economic management because it, a lot of it is. It's a con game, you know. It's a confidence game, you know. You 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 are you. Are, one has to be very careful about how one uh, uh, pursues policies uh, in in such a fraught, uh, what such a difficult situation. I hope that has been helpful to you, uh, Abravish. Thank you, sir. There is another question, but I think there's a question in chat box also. Uh, could could somebody read the question to me, please? Yes, Professor uh, Wong Kun Meng has asked uh, on, about your comments on the potential effects of translating <coughs> towards de-dollarization. Well, de-dollarization has already begun. It has been happening for some years now. Uh, as uh, you I, as you go as you, you as you use fiscal, uh, sorry, financial policies against uh, your enemies. Uh, the enemies are going to reject uh, to to react. They are going to look for alternatives. So the Russians have been talking about an alternative payment system. The Chinese have been talking about an alternative payment system, and so on and so forth. Um, now, getting all these systems to come together to create a true alternative is not easy. It's going to take time. Um, but if you force people together, which is what the U.S. seems to be doing. To its enemies, forcing them to cooperate with each other, uh, it is likely to accelerate. But let's face it, you know, it's not easy to do that when your bargaining position is 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 relatively uh, weak. So Russia is able to do it because they are saying, um, you know, you want our wheat, you want our oil and gas, we'll be happy to supply you uh, wheat and oil and gas even at a discount. But Please pay us in rubles, and uh, so you know that that's that's what Russia has been doing. China has been doing uh, more or less the same thing. Uh, China has been saying, "Well, if you want us to not to rely on 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 Russian oil and and uh, Russian coal, uh, you better give us uh, an offer which is attractive. You but and you pay us in renminbi, uh, and this is precisely what." Saudi Arabia has done, um, and and Qatar has done. So you know the the although those two countries are fighting with each other in the in the in the Gulf, they both have done deals with with China. But you know most of our countries are not China. We are not in that kind of strong bargaining position to 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 demand payment in our own currencies. So what happened during the 1970s and 80s is a very good pointer. So I'll give you. I'll tell you the story of what happened with Malaysia. Malaysia at that time uh, uh, became a significant palm oil uh, exporter, producer and exporter, uh, but it couldn't get into the European market because the Europeans discriminated against uh, uh, palm oil. At that time, they used different reasons, uh, and basically, they 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 had what is what economists call tariff escalation okay so the tariffs against palm oil were higher for refined palm oil um, compared to crude palm oil so basically encouraging developing countries to continue to export crude palm oil uh, so malaysia was ref already beginning to refine palm oil okay and uh, in fact it's a, the the whole story of refining of, of malaysian palm oil is a very interesting story it shows what developing countries can do you know because from scratch malaysian developed a, 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 a palm oil refining industry which within a decade became the world's most competitive palm oil refining now there were two things which helped eh? just to cut a, a long story short one one was the fact that palm oil uh, 
is is just one. So a refinery which is just working with palm oil uh, has to deal with two types of oil. What is called palm uh, palm oil, the usual the usual word palm oil refers to oil from the husk of the palm fruit. And then there's also the kernel of the seed. You break the seed and inside there's a kernel and you can get palm kernel oil. So there are two types of oil which you get from the palm fruit, okay? Uh, and and so, um, so the palm fruit, everybody agrees, is the cheapest source of vegetable oil in the world today, okay? It's, it's by far, by far. Okay, so the but the Europeans have been producing a lot of other things. So they use the common agricultural policy and various other forms of. So as the common agricultural policy protected the European uh, uh, oils, um, uh, you know, uh, rapeseed, mustard seed, sunflower seed, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, those those oils were protected first by the CAP and then more recently by saying, oh. Uh, Malaysian and Indonesian uh, plantations have slave labor. They are destroying the environment. Uh, they are, uh, uh, what's the third thing? Uh, slave labor, destroying environment. Oh, they are, they are stealing the land from, from, the, from the indigenous people. All of which are charges which have some degree of truth in them, okay? Uh, to, be, to, be, to be honest. But these things are blown out of proportion, exaggerated greatly, so much so that now you've had the European Parliament voted against palm oil. There were only six dissenting votes in a parliament of over 800 votes, 800 parliamentarians, only six dissenting votes. Okay, And th so this just shows you the, 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 the strength of the lobbies, Okay, the different types of oil lobbies. So right now, biodiesel in Europe, uh, Europe chose biodiesel, the Americans chose bioethanol. The, the biodiesel in, in Europe uh, uh, uses all kinds of other vegetable oils, which are far more expensive than palm oil. But they are used because palm oil is not allowed to get into the market. Now, there, so what, what, the, what Malaysians did at that time were two things. One, they made what are called butter deals. So the first deal was done with India. So they start, started importing uh, beef from India. Now, purely by chance, uh, buffalo meat is healthier than cattle, cattle beef, okay? Uh, I mean, if, if you're interested in beef, okay? Um, but, but it happens that way. And so, um, although it doesn't, it's, it's not as impressive, it's not flown, air flown from Australia or New Zealand and so on and so forth, it actually is uh, slightly healthier than than uh, than than uh, cattle cattle beef, but the point I'm trying to make is that basically today more than eighty percent of the beef um, of beef which Malaysians consume comes from India. You know something which is very surprising, especially since the the BJP has been ruling India for 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 some years. This continues to be the case. Now, uh, and a few other imports were also take, uh, so the idea was import from India and export to, to India. The next country was the Soviet Union. Similar deal was made. Then the third country was Pakistan. Similar deal was made. The fourth country was China. So these are all countries with large populations. So you basically found an alternative market for your refined palm oil. You had to sell at a, bit of a, at a bit of discount and so on and so forth, but basically it, it worked in, in those circumstances. Okay, So it's a very interesting story about how you managed to get a higher level of processing of, of basically what was once a raw, uh, a raw material, a, a primary commodity uh, in the case of, 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 of palm oil. Now, the, the, the point I was trying to make was that all these arrangements emerged at that time and could emerge at that time because Nixon had destroyed the Bretton Woods system in 1971. And there was chaos. There was no longer a reserve currency. Okay, So nobody knew how to go about doing things. And so countries like, in, the, in this particular case, Malaysia made these deals with all these countries. And so you had non-conventional trading partners of different types. And right now, for example, 
most of the um, of well, Mal Malaysia is not a very good example, but a lot of African chicken comes from the from the U.S. Okay, because basically the leftover from pressing the corn oil to to make bioethanol basically is sold off as chicken feed, very cheap. Yeah. And uh, so Africa basically imports its, its chicken largely from Europe previously, and now increasingly from the US. Uh, the only other country which can compete with, with the US in terms of poultry exports is, is basically Brazil. Now, the biggest single producer in China, China is actually a Thai company, Charon Pokpan, CP. Okay, so you, you have a situation where you find the developing country uh, 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 companies have been able to, to develop new initiatives in this kind of situation. Okay? Uh, and so you have much higher growth rates in, uh, uh, in developing countries uh, during, during the period, especially during the first decade of the 20th, 21st century. Um, but that period is largely over since the global financial crisis of 2008. And we have a situation where the situation, unfortunately, is not, is not going to get better, but it's going to get worse. And, and for the reasons which I was trying to suggest earlier. So I think we have a very, very difficult situation and we need to think very, very seriously about how to get around some of these problems. So what has that got to do with de-dollarization? These are all concrete examples of how you do not use the dollar as the, the, the unit for, 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 for transactions, okay? So now most of the audience will not remember this, but in 19, uh, when, when the Saudis successfully raised the, the price of oil in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1972, 73. When they did so, the Americans allowed the Saudis to do so because they wanted to support King Faisal at that time on condition that all the transactions would be in US dollars. Okay, so, they, so oil became the new currency. And that's why it was often referred to as the black gold because it became the new international currency. In fact, there were even proposals that instead of talking about the gold price, we should be talking about the oil price and so on and so forth. Okay, So the process of de-dollarization is happening, but it's not happening very fast. And it's unlikely to happen to accelerate. At certain points, it will accelerate. Like For example, what, what has happened with, with Ukraine, there's been an acceleration during this period. But nobody is exactly you know anxious to get out of of uh, of of um, of the of the dollar you know because the dollar also confers certain advantages the financial markets of the us are very very competitive with the rest of the world then with london and so on and so forth so a lot of people with big money that means the elites in our countries they prefer to do their, their transactions on, on American exchanges, on uh, using American dollars and so on. So there are a number of things, reasons why it's not going to be easy to, to de-dollarize. But the fact of the matter is de-dollarization has already begun and is accelerated during the past year, uh, but and is likely to continue to grow because of what is happening now with the, with the new Cold War and so on. But whether it will, you know, whether it will accelerate for other reasons is not clear. There are very few, there's very little reason to, to think that it's going to happen. And even if, it's, if it happens, I wouldn't make a fuss about advertising it. You know, you do these things below the radar. Don't attract unnecessary attention because as soon as you attract attention, you're going to get, you know, you're going to be put in place. So it's, you know, so countries are all looking at recent developments and thinking about how they are going to 
to to to cope, you know, in a very uncertain world. It's a very, very uncertain world, a very unfriendly world, a very non-cooperative world. So what do you do? And this is why it's very important to create a third force, a third force which is not going to get involved between in, in the new Cold War, but basically advocates cooperation, peace and cooperation. And that's, that's the basic message of, of, of tonight's lecture. Uh, Poonam, you, you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much for such an enlightening lecture. Um, I have a question like you mentioned in your lecture regarding uh, crop diversification and food security, like how the at the ground, ground level in India growing like more food and uh, crop, through crop diversification, the problem of food security can be solved. Like, uh, you know, in India, we know that primary, rice is primary food crop and it is uh, highly water intensive. There are uh, uh, many states like Punjab facing the problem of groundwater depletion. And also like there are crops, ragi, jar, bajra, which are micro, uh, rich in micronutrients uh, also. So on the one hand, there is problem of uh, uh, undernutrition and micronutrients deficiency. And uh, on the other hand, there is problem of water de uh, depletion. So uh, like, sir, could you, put some light on like how to like look at this uh, issue like uh, like simultaneously and linking this uh Poonam, i'm going to give a very very short answer because i dealt with food and, and nutrition in the last lecture uh, 10 days ago so i i don't want to revisit it and uh, there are people who are giving lectures in this series who are far more knowledgeable about indian agriculture than than i am and I certainly don't like to go around talking about uh, uh, about something I I know very little about. But I would say one thing which I think might be of universal interest, um, that the, the one way of producing much more food agriculture and healthy food agriculture is by pushing for uh, uh, broadening school feeding programs. And, uh, you know, uh, get, uh, uh, sorry, Japan was actually quite poor a century ago when they first introduced school feeding programs throughout Japan. And now Japan has the longest, uh, the highest uh, 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 life expectancy, partly due to the, the, the school feeding program and the kinds of dietary practices which were promoted through the school feeding program. There are also many other values which are promoted by school feeding program. For example, children at a very young age, uh, older children have to be responsible for younger children. They start cooperating with each other. The, the, the school feeding program, they, 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 clear the, they clear away the dishes and so on and so forth. They take responsibility at a young age. And all these are very important in terms of developing different values among young people. In my own country, Malaysia, we have a school feeding program. The school feeding program is basically uh, run by a, a, a transnational corporation. And that transnational corporation basically supplies all the foods, uh, all the food. So you, so children in the school feeding program eat uh, uh, things like uh, macaroni uh, and things like that, um, rather than food which is more, which is cheaper and more easily accessible uh, uh, for, for, because, but those things are not available sold through the through through the through the program. So I was in. I've been involved in two two countries. Uh, one one is uh, uh, Ch China, and this other one is Brazil, where I have learned. I think there's a lot to learn from these two experiences. So basically, the link should be between the school feeding program and farmers and parents. The parents exert quality control. To make sure, for example, that the vegetables do not have to uh, do not have toxic uh, insecticides, pesticides, and so on and so forth, and uh, are healthy and 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 and, and uh, to be eaten. And healthy doesn't mean uh, that there are no holes because of insect bites and uh, and and so on and so forth. So create different different ideas about what constitutes health, uh, good good vegetables to eat. And and in addition to that. You basically, uh, basically, a, a, a much more uh, affordable uh, vegetable-based diet uh, could be could could be done. 
could be introduced and, and successfully promoted uh, in, um, in, in many of our countries. So you have the farmers having a strong interest. So you, you buy the, the stuff from the farmers at a, at a, at a, at a guaranteed minimum price. Okay, uh, uh, and and so and the farmers will 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 be incentivized to to, to supply. So, for example, uh, you 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 can uh, in, you can agree to buy one every month, uh, one ton. Uh, I'm just making up the example. Yeah, one ton of uh, let us say uh, spinach from a cooperative. Now, farmers cannot produce exactly one ton. They are going to produce, uh, you know, in excess of that. It could be one and a half tons or something like that. So what are they going to do with the extra? They're not going to throw it away. They will sell it on the local market. Okay, and this is precisely what happened in the uh, the some of the villages I was uh, involved with in 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 China, where there was a problem of anemia among uh, among children especially girl children. And this was compromising their ability to reproduce and so on, you know. Even, even the, 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 mens the menses was affected because the, the, the bl uh, blood iron was, was insufficient and so on. So a regular supply of, bl of blood iron through red vegetables, red spinach, was, was deemed necessary in the Chinese context. So they promoted, they introduced this red uh, spinach which was quite alien in many parts of China. They introduced this, and then the farmers started producing and the excess was sold on the lo local market. So during the period I, I was involved from the year 2008, which was the year of the Beijing Olympics, and four years later, they found an even a changing diets, not only among the school children, the changed diets among the families themselves because of the availability of different types of vegetables, new vegetables, and so on and so forth. So you can actually have very many, um, you know, if you want to use a fancy economic term, you know, positive externalities and whatnot uh, from this, the, 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 this kind of, of, of synergies, you know. So it's very important, therefore, to involve the, 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 the farmers, to involve the parents and so on. And the only, right now, many countries, there's hardly any food production, vegetable production, fruit fruit production, and that's why the the the, the you you have very very slow progress in terms of micronutrient deficiencies. For example, if you look at the progress in terms of micronutrient deficiencies, I showed uh, 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 ten days ago. I showed the numbers for 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 um, progress. It's, it's very very slow. Okay? Very very slow. Carbohydrates, yes, no problem. But as far as micronutrient deficiencies are concerned, very slow. And the result is that you end up taking a lot of carbohydrates and you develop other types of problems, excess carbohydrates, just consuming a lot of carbohydrates. So you have overweight and obesity. The countries now with the highest obesity in the world are no longer the US. The US was number one until the end of the 20th century. Since the beginning of the 20th, 21st century, the countries with the highest levels of obesity are actually countries in Central America, Mexico and some of the other countries in Central America. It's partly because of stunting. So the body weight, the height weight uh, ratios are all affected and, and, and so on. But the, 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 the fact of the matter is that you have problems due to the kinds of diets people are having. So people are not starving, that's true, but they're having very poor diets. And so you have a whole range of problems associated with that. Excess, excessive uh, carbohydrate intake, uh, insufficient micronutrients, and so on. So it's very important to think about these problems. As far as the, the problems of, of water shortages and so on, these are very real problems for, for you in India. I, I, I know this. It's a problem elsewhere as well. But I think those things are better handled by people who, are, who know more about Indian agriculture than anything I've got to say. OK. OK, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ankur, any yes. other questions? Abravesh had a second question. Abravesh, can you ask your question now? Yeah. Uh, it's not a question per se, but uh, I just wanted to know uh, your opinion on uh, the current uh, 
uh, sort of situation on imperialism. There seems to be two sides to it. Both sides agree that uh, the system is sort of a broken system at this point. But one argues that, you know, you just leave the system to whatever it is and eventually something new out of it comes about and some the other group is arguing for uh, action. I just want to, I just wanted to know your opinion on how do you look at imperialism today and uh, and then sort of uh, the chances for third world countries to, uh, you know, come out of the system or challenge this system. Okay, I'm not sure what you mean by imperialism because the word imperialism now is used all over the place by all kinds of people to mean different things, okay? So I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by imperialism. Uh, my, my understanding of imperialism is, is uh, closer to the, the more recent work of um, Utsa and, Prabhash, but, uh, and Prabhat Patnaik, so, uh, as opposed to uh, some of the earlier work. So it is, it is not uh, a classical Leninist uh, view of imperialism, neither, neither is it a Hobsonian uh, view of imperialism and so on, and certainly not a Schumpeterian view of imperialism. But I don't know, I think you had more in mind, but you didn't express yourself fully. So perhaps you might elaborate what you meant. Uh, no, so... Prof, what I was trying to sort of suggest is there are a lot of, I mean, opinions these days which say or which try to suggest that, you know, not everybody is quite happy with the kind of policies the US has been following uh, in order to, you know, uh, in order to mitigate the crisis that is, whatever that is existing right now. Uh, well, that's and, a very specific, sorry, go, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, 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 and and some of these debates locate themselves in the historical uh, development of how the system post 2008 crisis itself has faced a particular economic uh, problem where you know the say professor patnaik only says this that you know you extracted as much uh, from the third world countries that you don't have any markets left and therefore if demand is what will lead growth you don't have any more markets where growth can take place. Therefore, you have an economic situation where stagnation is uh, quite an eventual possibility and today we are so sort of seeing it. And now there are two sides to this debate broadly from whatever I could figure out. One side says that, you know, you just leave the system to whatever it is. It's, it's, it's in a crisis, but it'll, I mean, uh, something better will come out of it. You don't need any policy action per se. The third world countries will be fine. The other group says that, you know, you need policy action. Uh, they, they're not very clear as to what kind of poli policy action, but they, they, they argue that policy action is quite important for uh, third world in order to at least challenge their very underprivileged position inside the system. I just wanted to know what your opinion is on this particular issue. Okay, I, I think that one of the big problems we've had in the last few decades is a simplistic equation of imperialism with globalization. I think this is a, a, a silly mistake which was made to equate globalization with imperialism. Imperialism is much more complex and globalization is a very important, are, are very important. The different dimensions of globalization are important phenomena, but there's no simple uh, equation of the two. And that, that I think was a first analytical mistake. Now, as far as um, the political choice of, you know, let's do nothing or do, you know, and, and the system will collapse and everything will be nice after that. Of course, I mean, that's, I, I have to reject that system, that, that argument, because there's not, no guarantee that you will have a better outcome. You know, that, that kind of view was the view of people, you know, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the, in, you know, I don't know who, who who actually advocates that, but it's a completely naive view. We have seen, for example, how ethno-populism is so powerful all over the world now. You know, we are talking ethno-populism is, is very important in the US. Ethno-populism is very important in India. 
ethnopopulism is important in many countries all over the place. It could express itself in cultural terms. It could express itself in uh, so racial terms. It could express itself in tribal terms. It could express itself in caste terms. It could express itself in religious terms and so on and so forth. Whatever it is, the point is that you have people, you have a lot of this being encouraged by um, by uh, by mobilization around these kinds of identities. And so the rise of uh, identity politics, uh, which was encouraged to some extent by in the postmodern period for the last four decades or so, uh, basically has reinforced that. So there is no guarantee of a better outcome just because the system collapses. You know, the, the, you know, in the worst case scenario, if we have war, if we have a nu nuclear apocalypse, there won't be anybody around. Okay, let's face it. You know, do you think the globe, the lives of the global south are going to matter very much to 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 the, the people elsewhere? If they're going to wipe each other out, they're going to and we are going to get wiped out in the process. I'm 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 completely serious about this. You know, there, there is no, there are no restraints. There are no restraints on provocations. Look at what happened in 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 uh, Taiwan. You know, look at what happened in in um, what do you call it uh, uh, with, with uh, Maidan and and uh, the NATO expansion and so on. You know, so there's no guarantee anything is going to come out better. You know, and who where 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 do you have a better outcome? You know, Lula got elected in Brazil by a margin of less than 1% of the vote, okay? Which shows you that Bolsonaro, who represents, in a sense, uh, a certain kind of ethno-populism, if you will, uh, you know, was a very, very strong incumbent. So I think it's very important for, uh, for us to recognize that, that there's no guarantee of a superior outcome. Now, what you do in this context, I think, that, you know, I, it, it would not be for me to, to give you a one-size-fits-all. Fits the big problem is that, you know, when you have one-size-fits-all kind of an approach, you know, basically nobody is well-served. Nobody is well-served by a one-size-fits-all approach. You know, so I think it's very important for us to recognize that, you know, uh, the, the, that, you know, the kind of debate which happened a century ago are still quite relevant. You know, if imperialism is alive and well, what does it mean? You know, if capitalism is the only game in town, what does that mean? What does that imply? What do you do in this kind of situation? They're not, not easy answers. And, you know, many people think that the prospect of war is so remote. I know that just before the last U.S. election, the U.S. Secretary of, of State actually wanted to start a small war because a small war which the US would prevail they could they, they would look good and the, the calculation at that time was that a small war nothing nothing big like going going to fight with iran or anything like that or let alone russia you know a small war maybe venezuela or something in southeast asia and there were efforts to start that war you know and that war, it was hoped by 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 uh, the advisors, would basically deliver, uh, would ensure that Mr. Trump would win, just like Mrs. Thatcher got re-elected because of the of the Falklands War in 1982, uh, you know, or George Bush got re-elected in in 1994 because of the Oh, sorry, in two thousand four, because of the, um, because of the, of the Iraq War, you know, the fact that you are fighting a war on a completely bogus premise does not bother any of them. You know, this is the world we live in, so we are just cannon fodder as far as they are concerned. You know, so I think we have to take very very seriously the the th the real threat of war, you know, and. Look about look at other things. 
Germany has tripled its, its military spending, tripled its military spending. Its property gets destroyed by the US and it says nothing. Sweden, which is supposedly independent, uh, neutral, you know, this, uh, this, this, uh, 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 goes and investigates and will not tell anybody what it found. I mean, what kind of, this is the world in which we live. You can go to war by mistake. You can go to war by, you know, on the basis of false premises. So I, I, I'm sorry, I sound like a, you know, uh, uh, as if I'm pleading, but I think we have a situation where it's very dangerous. And you, particularly, you have a country like India, which has got some military capacities, which is quite keen to flex its muscles. It didn't prevail uh, as much as it would have liked to uh, in, in relation to China. Uh, and there was a last war which 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 happened, you know. Fortunately, you know it didn't explode into something bigger. But you can have all kinds of things happening, you know. It's not as if we want them or anybody necessarily wants a war to get out of hand, or anybody wants to use uh, uh, nuclear weapons to begin with. But the logic of these kinds of situations is not a lo logic of of you know of uh of uh you know of, of of avoiding war you take for example one of the greatest critics of the american strategy vis-a-vis -vis ukraine is a very famous uh, american political scientist named john mearsheimer okay he was at uh, west point he trained in west point and later became an academic and so on very influential, considered to be the father of the realists in, in, in America. And what does Mishima want? He says America is it's stupid for America to go to war in Ukraine. America is responsible for the for the war in Ukraine. America provoked this, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But what is his recommendation? Stop the war in Ukraine, focus on China. We have to contain China. That is his recommendation. Okay, so you know, so you end up in a world where you suddenly you find yourself supporting a warmonger like like uh, Henry Kissinger. You know, who at least doesn't want a war with China as well. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's a perverse world. You know, when we these are the choices which we have. So I, I, I'm. I'm sorry to sound very, uh, you know, so, you know, we, but there are no easy solutions either. But but basically, to win the confidence of the people, to win the confidence of the public, you basically have to demonstrate what what the you know it's it's a it's an alternative type of of uh, patriotism or nationalism which has to be offered. As opposed to an ethno nationalism, as opposed to ethno populism, that is really the alternative, for, especially for developing countries, especially in the face of continued uh, dom domination by by powers beyond us. And unfortunately, now they are mainly Western powers. And you know, in the past, I used to make a big distinction between Europe and 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 the US. But now I, I, the distinction is a bit, you know, I find it a bit tortured now to try to make that distinction. So I'm sorry to sound very, very, uh, maybe I, I'm, I'm getting a bit, uh, 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 you know, dejected in my old age. <laughs> but uh, I, I really think it's very important for you all to think very, very seriously about the prospect of war. War is not something where you plan you think about the, how world war one began you know you know he stumbled into war when the americans stopped japan from getting oil supplies japan said felt it had no other choice but to go into world war ii you know it had it didn't want plan to do so remember keynes eh? to me the greatest work keynes ever did 
is a, a small booklet called the economic consequences of the peace you know you the 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 the, the alliance had prevailed and defeated germany but when they went to versailles to make a treaty in versailles they basically treated germany as defeated basically gave no way out and that was what people like hitler and so on basically could make full use of to foment the kind of nazism which 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 emerged emerged after uh, sorry after after that after world war 1 and which led to world war 2 you know so you know you you need to you you you, you know you we do not have victors which who are generous you know they are they want to get everything out possible out of victory so once they got they they once gorbachev no longer served their purposes they just didn't bother with honoring the promises they made to gorbachev you know and even somebody who was a who was prepared to do their bidding like like boris yeltsin even that you know boris yeltsin destroyed the russian economy the russian economy collapsed by half russian economy only recovered about a decade ago to what it used to be in in 1992 you know it took it took it took uh, you know two decades to recover and now with the war it's going to go, go back even further you know so we i think one one should not underestimate the cost of war the cost the waste of war you know besides the obvious things in terms of bloodshed and lives lost and so on and so forth it's just from an economic point of view the old arguments that you know oh during a war time situation you can have a mobilization of all your resources and the economy can go at full blast and so on those arguments do not prevail anymore look at the way the war is being fought in ukraine look at the way other wars are being fought you know it's a very high tech war nowadays so I, i think we really need to think very carefully but the, the relationship between war and imperialism is a complex one it's not a simple straightforward one so i'm i'm sorry i didn't give you any clear answer habravish but uh, you know it's something which i i, I worry about in, increasingly and uh, during the last last few months it is very clear nobody wants to you know the, the the west there's no interest in finding a way out even though you have a european head of the un right now he nobody listens to him and he does he's given up even trying he's given up even trying so this is a very very dangerous situation we are in now you know and is basically left to 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 you know three three governments you know the G- french german and and uh, the uk government thanks prof thanks 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 very much and perhaps my question also wasn't as clear as it should be but thanks so much for the response thanks abravish we have one last uh, comment in the chat box uh, from wong meng which says that in the early part of the 20th century japan's ambitions were a lesser cause for southeast asia's unraveling now japan's insecurities tag them along with the united states it seems always that self interest takes precedence over all if you would like to comment on this professor you know i think it's very important to recognize that that the, the japanese situation after the meiji restoration was not a simple straight line you know it was back and forth it became it became very very emboldened uh, after defeating russia you know and the, the asian countries all over the asia were were were, were cheering when japan uh, de- defeated russia um and uh, you know he was a, an asian country defeating a a, a a a a european country then after that 
you know, there were a number of reforms which took place in, in, in Japan. And, and uh, Japan is, has got almost, you know, very, very few uh, natural resources, as you all know. And became, got caught in a situation where it had in a, became extremely dependent on the the what what the US uh, and it also had developed a certain arrogant imperialist imperial ideology first vis-a-vis -vis China you know and um, well especially vis-a-vis -vis China it attacked when it attacked China nobody paid attention it attacked Manchuria very early on in the in 1930s nobody gave nobody cared when it attacked uh, even uh, the, the Chinese mainland, nobody cared. It wasn't as if everybody came to Chinese, China's defense. I mean, there was a China which was very pro-Western. It, uh, uh, it was Chiang Kai-shek, you know, but nobody cared. So now the situation is that since World War II, Japan has clearly been subordinated to the US. What has happened recently, is a very dangerous thing, where Abe, in his second term as prime minister, the long term, he basically so-called normalized Japan. What does it mean to be normalized? It basically means you behave like an imperialist country. So Japan now, there are no holes but in terms of Japan using uh, 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 what do you call it? So-called peace, peace. Uh, what is it called? Uh, Self-defense forces abroad. Okay, all the restrictions, most of the restrictions have been lifted. This is Abe's thing. Now, there is resistance, especially in Korea, to this. Um, and of course, in China too. But the Korean resistance was more during the last president. This new president is so anxious to keep the US-led alliance going that he doesn't seem to, to care very much. You know, now... So we are living in a very, very dangerous situation. But thankfully, Nishida is not as aggressive as, as Abe or even Suga after him. Okay, So I think I don't want to exaggerate the role of individuals. But I think to think of country imperatives as if they are unchanging over a century and so on and so forth, um, you know, I think the case has to be made, you know, and the conventional histories of, of, of the rise of Japan and so on. And, you know, I, I, I had to learn a lot of this, uh, you know, when I was criticizing uh, uh, Tun Mahade's, uh, Mahade's uh, what do you call it, uh, East policy, because they, it was based on a complete misunderstanding of American, of, of Japanese policy. But, you know, Japanese policy was quite subtle. You know, it wasn't simply crude. You know, they 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 always had collaborators. They always had collaborators. I mean, look at look at Taiwan. You know, the 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 opposite the 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 ruling party now is uh, they they are, they are ethnic Chinese, and they are very supportive of of uh, of. Uh, of Japan, you know? So what, what did, when the Japanese ruled Taiwan, why is it that these people were so, are so willing to collaborate with the, Jap with the Ch Japanese? Now you can call them all kinds of names, but I think it's very important to recognize this. Japanese imperialism in Korea, Jap Korean industries emerged under Japanese imperialism something which did not happen in India, it didn't happen in, in Malaya, it didn't happen in, sub, in, in colonial Af British colonial Africa, and so on and so forth. So there are varieties of, of, of practices, you know, of colonial practices and so on, which we need to begin to, to analyze very, uh, you know, uh, to 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 recognize what kinds of policies are appropriate in different situations, but I I I take your point that you know that there, there, there are some abiding imperial interests, but it's the the story is 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 quite complicated, and that's why it's important to to st strengthen those forces who are less 
uh, aggressive, less militaristic, uh, less uh, prone to 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 uh, joining the the U.S.-led encirclement of China, to, and so on. You know, these are these are important uh, policy options which many governments have to deal with. You know, and it's not. And um, let's face it. The, you know, you are dealing with. You're not really dealing with a, a, a choice between capitalism versus something else. You're basically dealing with different types of capitalists and the different terms of, of, of capitalist engagement. So I think we have to recognize the realities of the world in which we live and uh, and and begin to think of what are the important, what, what should be, to use an old cliche, you know, what should be the, the main issue you want to address? You know, um, and and uh, how, where do secondary issues? Uh, how do they relate to that? And 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 devise things accordingly. I think for the for the global south, I think I've tried to make the case as to why one should should not uh, uh, accept the U.S. leadership. But neither do I am I advocating to 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 go and accept uh, China's leadership. You know. That has a it's very high cost as well, and one has to recognize those very high costs, and un, very few countries are prepared to bear those costs. Well, I think we are run, running out of time. I want to thank you all. You have been a very uh, um, patient audience, and I hope this has been a useful um, discussion. Uh, there's much more to be done. Uh, and I do hope uh, uh, ideas and others will will address these problems because these are, I mean, at the risk of of sounding a bit uh, exaggerated, these are matters of life and death. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. We have already closed the time, so we can close the session for now. And thank you very much for delivering these lectures on behalf of ideas team and all of the participants i would like to thank you very much and these have been very informative and enlightening for all of us it was an honor to have you teach us so thank you very much sir thank you ankur so, and thank you everybody else good night and before we close this session i would just like to make an announcement that we have another two-part lecture series open for public participation and the lectures will be delivered by Dr. Ahilan uh, from Sri Lanka who is a senior lecturer at the University of Jaffna and writes regularly on the political economy of Sri Lanka. He will deliver two lectures on 27th February and 1st March at the same time as this lecture 4.30 p.m. Indian time. And these lectures will be about the economic crisis in Sri Lanka and the debt restructuring and the IMF trap in Sri Lanka. So if you are interested, please visit the, our web, courseware website and register for these lectures. And thank you once again to everyone for joining today. And special thanks to Professor Jomo. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Good night.